Well, here we are, Ted. We're here to get Occam to join us for our school project. Excellent! Hello, boys. My name is Occam, and this is my razor. In philosophy, Occam's razor is the problem-solving principle that recommends searching for explanations constructed with the smallest possible set of elements. Or in easier-to-understand terminology, the simplest answer is usually the right one. Now I can't see that principle ever being challenged by any individual ever. This is not Gaster. It cannot be Gaster, and I am sure of it. Okay, I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. A few days ago, Toby Fox released the Deltarune Winter Newsletter 2024, with a whole Valentine's Day theme. On top of definitively killing off Woody Theory and showing some really cool concept art, he also gave everyone who got the letter a handful of Valentine's Day cards, written by your favorite Undertale and Deltarune characters. Dear Recipient, give this card to your mom. Dear Recipient's mom, give this card to your mom. <laughs> they're cute, they're funny, and there's 50 of them. Among these letters, the rarest letter of all is one from, well, I'll let you come to your own conclusion. It's a strange letter. It's more or less completely illegible. But if you squint your eyes and you squint your heart, for some reason you feel you could understand it. Well, Happy New Year! Or was it the old year? Well, in any case, how is Deltarune? As you are waiting patiently, the time is going around. There was even a rumor of Valentine's Day. How absurd. Every day is a day of love, if only you believe it so. Do you believe it so? So, the purpose of the message. I want to help. Yes, there was someone I wanted to help. I seem to have forgotten who. Yes, it's quite ironic, but I seem to have forgotten. Was it myself? No. Well, perhaps. Regardless, when I see them, I'm certain I will know it straight away. I never forget someone I don't remember. Will you help me? You are very odd, responding out loud to a letter. But you seem reliable. I will be counting on you. Now, put on your coat and wash your face. Or, put on your face and wash your coat. Not necessarily in that order. Or in any order at all. Goodbye. There was a sound like something walking away. And the letter was gone. Shortly after this letter released, it completely disappeared. I mean, going to that link now leads to an empty blank Valentine's Day card. Let's just be honest with each other. Is there really more than one character who could have written this? I mean, before we even talk about what I think or what you think, it's very, very obvious that our minds went to Gaster before anything else. It seems purposefully intended for Gaster speculation. First and foremost, the actual letter is basically asking us how we're enjoying Deltarune, comments on us waiting patiently, and then asks us if it will help the writer with their goal to help, well, somebody. They forget who. Despite this, they say that we seem reliable and will be counting on us. We know that Gaster is the only character to be canonly aware of Delta Rune and the only character who's ever spoken directly to us from inside the game world. There are, without a doubt, more characters beyond the Veil of Darkness, hidden in that mysterious black abyss that we've spoken to Gaster in. Goners, deaths, eyes that peer at us from the corners of rooms, maybe more. We don't really know who or what resides in what fans call the depths. Besides, of course, Gaster. So, as of this moment, definitively, it seems as if this is Gaster. However, I'm not so sure. No, actually, I don't think it's Gaster at all. And to prove it, I'm going to do some obtuse textual analysis. There are a whole bunch of detailed methods on the internet to uh, analyze speech and dialogue and characters, but usually these are meant for human speakers, so I'm not going to use any kind of, like, scientifically proven way to analyze dialogue. Uh, this is a character written by an individual who we're not meant to include as part of the analysis, so I've broken the process of analyzing character dialogue down to an, well, uh, equally complicated method. Here it is. In order to identify the speaker, we can break down this language into four separate attributes. Cadence, aka the rhythm of the sentence. The actual definition of cadence is like, the way your words flow and generally covers the sound of speech, but we don't have sound, so I'm using the word as a catch-all to describe the general flow of dialogue. We can look at sentence structure and speaking patterns to define what I personally consider the character's cadence. Language, by looking at the kind of words, level of formality, and concepts discussed by this character, we can understand things about their maturity, emotional state, etc. 
context. Basically, the context behind a message. If a character talks about the Vietnam War as if he was there, the context that is added to the speaker's character is that he's a Vietnam veteran. Finally, function the point and intention of the message. In a large story, the function of a character's dialogue changes sentence to sentence. However, if we look at the function of the message, we can line it up with previous functions to determine whether or not this individual's goals ever conflict with each other. It's worth mentioning that context and function are determined by the plot, whereas cadence and language are determined by the character. Typically, you only need cadence and language to find out who is speaking a line of dialogue. This line, for example, is quite obviously spoken by Papyrus. However, context and function can allow you to understand if something a character has said sounds wrong or out of character. Truthfully speaking, dialogue being deemed out of character is usually not a good piece of evidence for it to be secretly pointing to some larger mystery. However, with the very, very limited amount of Gaster interactions and knowledge that we have, his character feels purposefully built up in such a way that sloppy writing in this particular instance is a somewhat, at least, good argument for this being a different character. Regardless, by deconstructing his speech to identify how it falls into these four concepts, we can figure out if this is or isn't Gaster. First, like I said, we need to look at Gaster's general cadence and language, using every instance of Gaster dialogue we have. In terms of speech patterns, Gaster speaks in tiny, statement-like bursts. The spacing comes into play here. Sure, Gaster technically says, I have something, something I want to show you, something I think you will find very, very interesting. But that's not how he says it. No, each line is its own statement. I have something, break. Something I want to show you, break. Something, break. I think you will find, break. Very break, very break, interesting. The breaks after each word separate each of these into tiny little sentence fragments and control the way that you read him and hear him in your head. In the Goner Maker portion, Gaster's speech is slightly more put together. How do you feel about your creation? It will not hear, is altogether at once. However, the majority of the sequence still follows this pattern. Are we break, connected? Excellent, truly break, excellent, break, now, break, we may, break, begin, and it goes on, I'm not going to keep saying break. These line breaks define Gaster's natural speaking cadence and is a purposeful choice. You can see in several instances that three lines of dialogue can be printed without a break between them, and yet he continues to break the lines because, like I'm saying, you know, there's not a there's not a specific definitive statement I can make about this, but by having those breaks, by constantly having him pause, it defines the way that Gaster sounds in your head. That's really what it comes down to here. The continued use of this line break defines the way that we hear the dialogue. This continues not just in the intro, but across every Twitter appearance and entry number 17. So, short sentence-like bursts with frequent line breaks is very much a part of Gaster's characterization. Moving on, there are several speech quirks that Gaster has, specifically the way he repeats a word twice. In entry 17, he says, very, very interesting, and dark, darker, yet darker. In the Twitter takeover, he says, very, very interesting, and excellent, truly excellent. If you're willing to stretch out the requirements for a minute, you could even consider, of course, of course they are the same, and shall we? Shall we go again? This is a habit of Gaster's, repeating the same word or series of words twice. Moving on, we also pick up on a few words he says often. Wonderful and interesting are the two that I think are said the most by Gaster. Not necessarily requirements in Gaster dialogue, but their repeated usage does at least suggest that they're a permanent fixture in Toby's Gaster toolbox. I think that this is enough in terms of his cadence. Moving on to language, Gaster is very unique in terms of what words he uses. Big words, uh, scientific words. Frankly, I'm not like a pro wordsmith, so I'm not gonna pretend to be, but it's obvious that Gaster has always had a very formal, business-like tone. This is the kind of thing I'd write to my teachers back in middle school when sending them an email. The tone is so formal and so logical that sometimes what would be a simple statement becomes an obtuse collection of large words. To finally be here on the verge of connection, you have done excellently to persevere. The biggest proponent of this is honestly the save menu dialogue. It is barren and cannot be copied. Choose the target for the reflection. The division is complete. It will be subsumed. It conformed to the reflection. By no means is Gaster just a walking dictionary pulling out large words for the sake of it, but everything he says, as you've seen, is very formal, very specific. 
Finally, I think it's important to mention that Gaster has never been too emotional. We haven't seen Gaster existing yet, hanging around, doing his own thing. Everything we've seen so far is very purposeful. The only time Gaster shows any emotion is when he says, Now, show yourself, Deltarune. And even here, this is the only instance of him ever using exclamation points. While he says things like, to be here on the verge of connection is quite exciting, this isn't him showing that emotion through the dialogue. It's him outright telling us that emotion is how he feels about this. I've frequently described Gaster as plotting, because every message from him has explicit function that goes beyond a casual conversation. So this is how I'd define Gaster's cadence and language. How does it stack up with the Valentine's card? First off, in terms of cadence, none of the frequent Gaster stylizations show up. He does not repeat one word twice. He, while he does take several phrases and repeat them, they are not nearly in the same style as how Gaster does it. They are usually out of confusion or not knowing what the correct answer is. He doesn't use the word wonderful nor interesting, nor does he mention anything about darkness or light. This character does not speak in the formal manner that Gaster does. This dialogue is light, silly, whimsical, like talking to someone completely informally and friendly. Gaster's messages were entirely business. His complete formality is literally what's defined our understanding of his character up to this point. This character says things like, Happy New Year, or was it the old year? Well, in any case, how is Deltarune? There was even a rumor of Valentine's Day. How absurd. I want to help. Yes, there was someone I wanted to help. He exclaims that he wants to help. This is something he feels strongly about, and we can tell. I'd even go as far as to say that he's excited to help. He also shouts, put on your coat and wash your face. He does this same thing in exclamation when he ends the letter by saying goodbye. In this letter, there are four exclamation marks. This single Valentine's has more exclamation marks than Gaster has ever used ever. It adds to the general feeling of this being a whimsical, excited character. Furthermore, on the topic of whimsicality, this character is confused, in some kind of a daze. He doesn't know if it's the old year or the new year. He doesn't know who he's supposed to be helping. He doesn't know what order to put on your coat and wash your face. He also misspells goodbye. What? Gaster? Our Gaster? It conformed to the reflection Gaster also doesn't know how to spell goodbye? It's also worth mentioning that this is apparently an old-fashioned way of saying goodbye, though I've, I've had a hard time confirming this through research. Regardless, what I personally think is, it's a purposefully odd spelling of a common phrase to make this character sound odd, whimsical, confusing, or silly, I guess. That's the other thing about this dialogue. Yes, saying it's informal is accurate, but it doesn't paint a picture of just how jovial this is. This goes beyond being whimsical or light. It's silly. If I put Papyrus's talk sprite next to half of these lines, you'd probably believe it was spoken by him. This dialogue isn't something that's uniquely gaster like we'd normally expect from his sudden appearances. Silly back and forth confusion regarding mundane things that make us chuckle with this clearly goofy guy. The overall feel of this dialogue is in stark contrast to every other instance of Gaster. Every single one. An air of mystery is lost as this character puts his entire self on display, confusion and whimsical silly statements and all. He no longer speaks in short sentence-like bursts. Yes, his general statements are spread out, however, his pattern of each few words being broken up by a line break is no longer present. He uses longer statements and sentences. He doesn't use any obtuse large words that are present in literally every other Gaster conversation. Gaster's wording always felt like it sucked the fun out of the air, emptied the room of doubt or confusion. Specific, precise, needle thin. It's the only way I can really explain it. This is a character whose dialogue leaves absolute room for doubt. This character is definitively confused. He says things that don't make sense, but not because they're worded weirdly, but instead because they're twisty. Put on your coat and wash your face, or put on your face and wash your coat. Not necessarily in that order, or any order at all. That is a twisty, windy series of statements that do not feel like Gaster. Gaster doesn't break out Gandalf-like lyrical mazes to get our minds a twirling. He's matter of fact. Even if that means using a large scientific word in place of many smaller words, I don't feel like this character does that. The super frequent line breaks are gone. The formality is gone. The large specific wording is gone. This character is different. Jovial. Happy. Informal. Willing to wrap himself in large confusing sentences that leave him more confused than us. 
it doesn't feel like Gaster. But that's only one side of things. That's for the character heads in the audience. Now we appeal to the lore heads. Let's talk about context and function. Gaster, throughout every conversation, has known what he's doing. He shows up with an explicit purpose and carries it out. His goal revolves around us playing Deltarune. That's been his plan since the beginning. His only request is that we see it through to its completion. Why? Well, maybe you're like me and you think he's tricking us with a super linear prophecy and story that will ultimately benefit him in some way. Maybe you think he wants to save the world and create a new future. Regardless, it's clear that we've already agreed to help him when we clicked I accept in the survey program. Now let's talk about the Valentine's person. This character's entire purpose is to ask if we can help him. Forgetting about all the other goofy dialogue for a minute, the character says the purpose of this message is that he needs to help someone, but he doesn't remember who. He asks us if we'll help him help them, before saying that we seem reliable and that he will be counting on us. This goes against the already existent context regarding Gaster and us helping him. First off, this character asking us to help him help someone isn't the kind of thing Gaster would ever do or even need to do. We are already helping Gaster, signing a digital contract as soon as we open survey program. And he's the type of character to plan ahead, to know things. So much so that when you copy three files, he says preparations are complete. He clearly has some kind of a plan. So to randomly reach out to us and vaguely ask us to help him help someone else, that just doesn't make sense to me. Not only that, but this character says we seem reliable. That's not the kind of thing you say to someone you've known for a while. Now, on the topic of Delta Rune, ah, oh God. This character simply asks, how is Delta Rune? Before saying that as we are waiting patiently, the time is going around. It's very hard to think of another character besides Gaster who knows of the existence of Delta Rune. But, this is part of a much larger discussion. First off, there are numerous things called Deltarune. The program that Gaster provided us and has explicit control over is called Deltarune. The legend in-game is called The Legend of Deltarune. The video game we download off of Steam in the Nintendo eShop is called Deltarune. Spacing is kind of important in both the English and Japanese versions of Deltarune. The game Deltarune is one word while the legend is two words. Delta Rune. The object in universe is also called the Delta Rune. So this Valentine's refers to Delta Rune with a space, while Gaster on Twitter referred to the game Delta Rune without a space. Ah, oh, boy. I'm not going to put too much emphasis on this, but the fact that it's spaced does kind of imply that this character is talking about the legend rather than the game itself. You could even push this farther. Gaster saying, show yourself, Deltarune, only to provide us with survey program, could imply there's something else named Deltarune we're not thinking about. Something like, I, I don't know, the, the vessel? Okay, this is kind of stupid, I understand that, but consider this. Perhaps the vessel is the Delta Rune. Delta can mean different or the changing of something or relating to the difference between two things, whereas Rune can be a magic stone, an incantation, or perhaps a poem or story. If the vessel's purpose was to create a new future, could Delta Rune be its formal name? Survey Program, aka the Delta Rune Program, allows us to inhabit the Delta Rune that will be used to create the new future. This is stupid. This is, this is really stupid. But my point in theorizing it is that we don't even understand the name Deltarune yet. So to come to the conclusion that this character has to be referring to the video game Deltarune is foolish. Especially when the specific separation of the words indicates they're talking about something else. Gaster isn't even the only character to have knowledge of how we interact with the Deltarune world through the video game structure. Ralsei also knows this. He specifically remarks about pressing Z. There's obviously so many more characters we haven't seen yet, and probably some characters who have similar amounts of knowledge to Gaster. But what we know about Gaster is that he's smart, he's knowledgeable, he has a plan, he's already met us, he's already asked us for our help. And this character shares none of those traits. One more thing about Gaster's backstory that doesn't quite line up with this letter is that Gaster was never actually confirmed to be forgotten. Yes, this letter could be the confirmation that's lacking this entire time. However, Undertale was kind of made a point actually out of telling us that Gaster wasn't forgotten. Asgore specifically took a long time to find his replacement due to his unmatched brilliance, which doesn't make sense if he uh, didn't remember him. This line only makes sense if Gaster was remembered. And yet the character in this letter remarks that it's ironic he forgot who he's supposed to help. 
How is that ironic unless this character was forgotten? But that's weird because Gaster wasn't necessarily forgotten. Unfortunately, this brings me to a dead end. The character's cadence does not match with Gaster. The character's function in contacting us contradicts with what we know about Gaster. This character's language is different than that of Gaster. And yet, who else could it be? A mysterious letter that openly calls us out and asks us about how we've done waiting for Deltarune, only to then disappear without a trace? I mean, come on, that, that sounds like a clear sign of Gaster and nobody else. Any other character or suggestion has too little information to truly determine if it's right or not. Any actual explanation requires not only ample evidence that the alternative suggestion more closely matches the style of this speaker, but also a plot explanation for why this character would act in this way and contact us in this way. So, for many, the safest answer, despite all of the above issues I've presented, is Gaster. Oh, shoot, by the way, before I move on, there's also the fact that the Japanese style of speaking for this character is entirely different, and according to a few Japanese speakers, is so different it would require a logical leap to come to the conclusion that this is Gaster. I don't want to talk about this too much, okay? But pause if you want to see what I have to say. <laughs> Okay, so as I was saying, Gaster. It all goes back to Gaster. And why complain? I mean, here's what we've been asking for for so long, right? An actual sign of life from this game's big, mysterious character. Since 2015, we've been waiting, and here it is. So why complain? Well, this is again going to be me talking about my personal opinions about stories, but it all comes down to the secret fifth aspect of understanding character that I didn't mention. Presentation. You see, every character in every story is defined by their presentation. What makes SpongeBob and Squidward's relationship goofy instead of abusive? What makes Batman a hero instead of a classist criminal? What makes the battle against the Empire exciting and action-packed rather than horrifying and scary? It's all presentation. Concepts and facts are nothing without serving them to us on a silver platter of purpose. People come and go from your life. You watch millions of stories pass you by every single day. Millions of heroes in their own battles. But you couldn't care less about the person who just saved a life, who finally won his own battle against evil, who discovered something magical that in his eyes gives new meaning to life, because you just watched him pick his nose and throw it on the floor. That's disgusting. But characters aren't like that. You only see them through a unique lens that only shows you the moments meant to convey a message or argument or feeling. People aren't characters, and characters aren't people. Papyrus never sat down on Undertale on the couch and said, Oh god, this day was rough. Listen, I don't have it in me to be too silly right now. I honestly would just prefer to take a nap. Maybe tomorrow, though. Alright, uh, have a good night. Because that goes against everything we know about Papyrus. That would make no sense. I want to say something along the lines of all characters are one-sided, but people will misinterpret that. I guess what I mean is characters are thin straws that contain water and move them from point A to point B without the water swirling around too much or changing shape, whereas people are tubs of water, able to hold so much more nuance than the straw, an unmeasurable mass of undulating fluids, changing form, reflecting a vastly different image moment to moment. It's impossible to comprehend this tub of water but it's not impossible to comprehend the straw. The water in that straw is a character, being pushed from the beginning to the end, in a tight, unchanging capsule. Characters who go on crazy arcs? That's a bendy straw. Twists and turns push them in directions we previously didn't expect. Characters can change and develop and grow and learn and lie and act differently between situations, but you never look at the character and say, wait a minute, you shifted so much I don't even recognize you, unless the purpose of the 1A is to call that shift out to the audience. Undertale has plenty of characters who act or talk one certain way, only for them to act or talk differently later. Sans, Asgore, and Undyne all do this. Sans acts like, well, Sans, but periodically gets incredibly serious. And in the genocide dialogue, he talks about complex concepts involving time travel and comments on our choice to keep playing despite everything. Even then, though, Sans is still Sans. He still acts a very specific way, dunks on you, still speaks in the same cadence he always does, uses similar words, he's the same Sans. Undyne is probably the biggest shift of them all. She's uber serious, going through the regular royal guard speech, only to say screw it and completely act like herself. Now, with all of these instances, characters go from acting one way to another way. In the case of Undyne, a character specifically goes from ultra serious with very little personality to completely exciting and fun and kind of silly. However, in all three of these instances, these characters shifting into their more natural or more serious behaviors are shown specifically to be a contradiction. 
The surprising nature of the shift is always focused on. Asgore specifically is built up as this huge threat. Everyone says his name in red, his name has got the word gore in it, and this moment where he's just completely nice is supposed to feel shocking. Tonally, it's shocking. Same with Undyne. Her saying screw it and acting more like herself is showing us that, yes, this character is totally different than we've been expecting. The contradiction between this version of her personality and the ominous knight who's been chasing us is specifically called out through this fast-paced moment with loud music, wild camera cuts, and irreverent shouted dialogue. This shift doesn't you know, naturally happen. We don't see her serious, then walk into the next room and she's acting this other way. It's a specific moment that the game fully focuses on to show you this change. Also, even in these instances, all of these characters still act like themselves. They don't carry a completely different manner of speaking and certainly don't say things that go against what we know about them. The Valentine's card isn't like this. I don't like the idea that this is just more character development for Gaster because every single instance of Gaster has acted the same way. This random note is suddenly very, very out of character, and there's no noticeable shift that's focused on. I would instantly accept this if the letter started off like, Welcome, I have something very, very important to say to you. Happy New Year! And then continued on. This example clearly establishes the shift from personality A to personality B as something that is natural to this character. Hey, you know Gaster? Well, here's more of him. Rather than, here's Gaster in a completely unique, unexplainable state. For this to be character development, it's like taking the water going through the straw and putting it in that tub with more water. That really doesn't help our perception of his character. If this is Gaster, it doesn't achieve much functionally. Well, we've already said we'll help Gaster. If this is Gaster, all it really does is tell us, also, he's silly. It doesn't really add anything to his character. It if anything, I think it tears down the air of seriousness we've previously come to expect. That's why I don't like the argument that it's character development. But let's just say this is wrong. Let's just say this is character development. Again, you know, you might ask the question, what's wrong with it? Sure, maybe I don't believe it's Gaster, but what would be the problem if it was? Frankly, I think that making Gaster a goofball completely ruins him. I've already gone over the actual nitty-gritty of why I don't think it is Gaster, and why it goes against specific instances of Gaster that we've been shown, but I'd like to talk about my specific interpretation of Gaster. A few people have told me over the last few days on the Discord servers I'm in that I'm complaining over my personal headcanons being proven wrong, and I really don't like that wording, because headcanons don't have to be attached to any bit of reality, and they can exist in your mind without being affected by the outside world, but I will admit my displeasure is partially due to my personal feelings, my personal interpretation of the story. Regardless, I still think these thoughts are valid and relevant to the discussion. At least to me, Gaster has always been presented in a scary way. Every instance of Gaster was meant to be mysterious, spooky, I'd even go as far as to say, frightening. Specific Gaster-adjacent imagery and symbolism is meant to be unnerving. The bunker with the Gaster sounds, the sudden lack of any noise outside of this odd grinding. Entry number 17 talking about an experiment that's darker yet darker. Gaster's non-stop devil symbolism. The way that when you call in the dark world, the music just stops and this loud noise happens. When you enter his name, you're booted out of the game. These things are odd, frightening unnerving. Personally, in as few words as possible, which is still going to be many words, I think Gaster is closely tied to two parallel concepts. First, he is connected to the idea of a game being wrong. There's a very specific feel when you run into a glitch in an old video game. Missing No, the glitched Pokemon, looks wrong, and everything about its functionality is wrong. It levels up and down in ways that make no sense. It's not explained by the game, it's not meant to exist, so its sudden unexplained appearance feels wrong. It feels like this guiding hand that is the game that's been walking you through the story can't see the ghost that's staring right at you. You have no idea where it stops or where it ends because this isn't intended. This wasn't meant to happen. This is wrong. It goes parallel with the idea of the world around you being wrong. The idea that there's some eldritch monster behind the veil of reality staring at you at this very moment. Beasts you cannot describe in human terms. In a sense, these two things, a game being wrong and the world being wrong, go hand in hand. How would finding Missing No feel like to a Pokemon trainer? Well, I'll ask you. If you'd found a disgusting mass of indescribable form in the forest, and everyone treated it as if it was a normal pet, would you be able to sleep at night? Or would you be convinced that reality is falling to bits around you? 
that you're in hell. Toby is no stranger to turning game mechanics into actual in-universe plot devices. And Gaster? He feels like the general state of wrongness. He doesn't exist in the actual plot of the game, is bound by no rules, he shouldn't exist. And therefore, by simply being, he breaks the world around him. Another interpretation of mine, slightly different than the Eldritch Glitch interpretation, is that since day one, Gaster was going to be the closest we'll ever get to a real creepypasta experience. This strange ghost in the machine who's not supposed to be there. He is literally a cut character taking control of the narrative and existing behind the scenes. By being lost in the code, he is stuck in the underlying layer that reality is built from. He has witnessed the inner workings of the world around him, allowing him to act as a creepypasta villain and a strange Satan-like demon. I don't know if you like these ideas or agree with them, but this general sense of horror was so prevalent since the beginning. This feeling of digital wrongness, I guess I could say. You cannot tell me these different Gaster instances aren't meant to be unnerving. But this? This isn't meant to be unnerving. For the first time in a long time, I felt like there was this unique, absolutely weird and mysterious character who I so deeply cared about that half the reason I even really cared about Deltarune in the first place, besides the general idea that, oh my gosh, Undertale 2, is because I wanted to find him. If this Valentine's was Gaster, I would be disappointed. It's like if a Pokemon trainer found Missing No and then went on to say, yeah, they're my little glitchy, weird reality buddy. Like that, I guess this is going to sound like super, super annoying, but it's kind of like that, I guess, Gen Z style of absurdist humor where absurdist concepts are taken in stride rather than questioning them. I've seen it. I can't come up with an example. Say straw man all you want. I don't care. I know that, the, you know, the general feeling of, oh yeah, an eldritch demon. Well, want to go watch some movies together? That kind of lack of of reverence, I guess? I'm not sure. This is clearly not in the script, as you can probably assume. I don't like the idea that this character who's been built up in this specific way with this specific horror feel is suddenly not scary. Like, yeah, you know how creepy and weird he is. Well, he is your buddy. I don't like that. I mean, it's, I don't. I understand that silly characters can have serious stories, but this feels not like a natural expansion to the character Toby's been putting up, but a complete 180. I said it before, and I'll say it again. I don't think this is a super cool personality for Gaster to have, and I definitely don't think that this is a very unique personality for Gaster to have. Over the last few days, while trying to come up with non-Gaster alternatives to who could have written this letter, so many people have drawn comparisons to other characters, saying, uh, surely it's actually this character, it sounds like something they'd say, and yeah, I said earlier that it sounds like dialogue Papyrus would say, removing the context and specific mentions of being forgotten or Delta Rune, and it's true, if some of this dialogue was spoken by Papyrus, I don't think it would feel out of character. If some of this dialogue was spoken by Jevil, I don't think it would feel out of character. If some of this dialogue was spoken by silly Undertale NPCs, I really don't think it would feel out of character. Whimsy, jokes, and fun aren't things that Deltarune characters are lacking. This type of personality isn't something that I was desperately waiting to see in Deltarune. It's the exact type of personality I've already seen a lot of in Deltarune. Frankly, I don't really understand the excitement that this is giving some people. Why is there excitement for Gaster just being, you know, scrunkly goober number 78? Why is this characterization exciting? I understand that having fun characters is fun. It's fun for the fan base. It's fun for fan art. It's fun for people that looked forward to seeing this character after so long. But I don't think Deltarune is short on fun characters. I'm willing to bet that by the end of Deltarune, there will be plenty more characters like this. Characters who are whimsical and somewhat confused but still full of spirit, talking in silly mixed up riddles just like there has been for some time now. Right now, we only have a handful of main antagonist options. The most interesting one is Gaster, and I really don't think that's debatable. Are people this excited for the possibility of a faceless titan as a final boss? For an abstract god who represents the concept of fate or something? I feel like the only one character with enough of a personal connection to be really meaningful in that role was Gaster. And this just isn't that character. I want Gaster to be different than the rest of the characters. I want him to be unique, to be the darkness that all the other antagonists in the game don't have. The pattern of ominous or threatening character turns out to be silly and joins the gang has been present throughout the entire series so far, both Undertale and Deltarune, and for quite a while I've been saying to myself, no, 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 Gaster's not going to be like that. He's not going to be some silly guy like the rest of everyone else. From the beginning, I felt like Gaster is the point. Not the point of the whole game, but one of maybe three key core concepts that Deltarune grew off of. This is him falling in line. 
This is him speaking in that silly style that we know the games for. This is him being defanged and letting us know that our silly adventures we're excited for won't have him standing in the way, we're his special helpers. And I, I just don't like that. To get off script again for a moment, I know there are other creators, I know there are other people in the fanbase who love the idea of Gaster being a silly guy. And again, it's, it's really up to personal feelings. I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. If anything, I, I'm kind of jealous that you're excited over this because it's like, man, I wish I was excited over this. I get it. You know, I get the enjoyment of these silly kinds of characters. I'm not blaming you. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm certainly not saying you're wrong. God, you know, I'm all big on like, personal experience and letting people believe things, uh, I I super believe that it's okay if you like this. And I'm not saying that this is objectively bad, I just, I personally feel like this kind of dialogue is too close to everything else in the game to make me, you know, care about Gaster as much as I did when I feel felt like he was some kind of oddity, some wrongness that's completely different than everything else. And I don't know. I know even if he was going to end up like this, I wish that it would have been down the line at some point, much later, once his main story stuff has concluded. I don't know. And I mean, on top of things, my complaints might be objectively wrong. Carl Jung, philosopher, created the theory of collective unconscious. Basically, Carl argues that a segment of every mind contains similar imagery and concepts and is inherited. Like every mind taps into a layer of unconscious that holds core principles we all base our stories off of. This theory can be used to discuss the creation and spreading of myths. And, well, I kind of think that everyone, every person, has their own individual layer of unconscious that they pull from. It forms as you get older, your experiences, the things you like, the things you hate, all feeding it and it's distinctly yours. Recently, I've been watching videos of the Earthbound Halloween hack, trying to explain some of the weird similarities between it and Deltarune. The concept of choices not mattering, the roaring dark, an unsolvable maze. I keep asking myself, is this really a coincidence? Are all of these repeating ideas in Toby's work leading to some grand story he's always wanted to tell? Is it all linked somehow? Is the Earthbound Halloween hack the origin of Deltarune? And I mean, no. Perhaps that individual layer of unconscious in Toby's mind is drawn upon every time he writes a story, makes a game, writes a character. These repeating terms and ideas are things he likes, concepts and terms that fascinate him. Odd patterns between games are more so the mark of Toby Fox's style rather than some secret link. By complaining about the possibility of Gaster ending up like the other Deltarune characters and wishing that my interpretation is still the right one, perhaps I'm attempting to cut a hole through his unconscious layer. I'm ruining the basic foundation of the Deltarune world. Maybe Gaster, like everything else in Deltarune, feeds from that layer in Toby's mind. And to make him something else, something that I would like, is to essentially ruin Deltarune. Maybe not. Don't get me wrong, this isn't me going back on my thoughts. I do very much believe that this is a step in the wrong direction, if it truly is Gaster. And I do truly believe this isn't him. But perhaps by trying to argue an alternative, what I'm doing is coming up with a game that isn't Deltarune anymore. I want to include these counterpoints that, you know, maybe I'm just wrong, because I don't want people to think that I'm so overly negative for the sake of being negative. I'm not saying, you know, silly Gaster is objectively bad and anyone who thinks otherwise is wrong. I'm saying I really had a completely different interpretation of this character, the kind of creepy, you know, Ben drowned but actual game character where he's, you know, he's going to be a big thing in the plot and he's also this big thing for us. In the same way that Noel seems to be trying to find Des, I mean, we've been trying to find Gaster. Anyways, I guess that's how I'll rationalize my personal distaste for this. I hope you guys don't hate me for that little rant. If it's not Gaster though, who is it? Now there are plenty of options, but also there's only really two. Essentially, I can give you an infinite number of theoreticals here. This is a goner, this is someone stuck in the same void as Gaster, this is someone who's exploring a darker world, this is a fragment of Gaster! Anything like that requires one thing we don't have, the end of Deltarune. As the plot evolves, we'll learn more about the makeup of the Deltarune world. This could easily explain away this note as being from someone else, but this is a complete theoretical. And I'd rather not end this video by saying the writer of this note is a completely new character I've just made up. Anyways, I'm starting to think this entire video is pointless, because it's taken me a really long time to get here, but I know who it is. Or at least, who this letter sounds like a lot more than Gaster. It's the Eggman. Now before you write this off as another uninformed guess, let's look at the evidence. Again, let's bust out the dialogue analyzer. I'm going to be doing these both side by side to speed this up. There is one common phrase that accompanies the Eggman. Well, there is a man here. And after you get the egg, 
Well, there was not a man here. Remember how I said I wish if it was Gaster that it started off with some telltale sign that it was Gaster? Take a look at the very first thing this letter says. Well, Happy New Year, or was it the old year? Well, in any case, how was Deltarune? Two sentences that start with well before the rest of the sentence. The well isn't necessary in this dialogue, and it is separated by a line break. In either pieces of dialogue, its inclusion feels purposeful. By having the Valentines contain these instances of sentences unnecessarily starting with well, I think that this could very much be a sign that we are talking to the Eggman. The Valentine's card frequently has this feeling of going from A to B or B to A, comparing X and Y like Tweedledee or Tweedledum. Happy New Year. Or was it the old year? Was it myself? No. Well, well, perhaps. Put on your coat and wash your face, or put on your face and wash your coat. The bouncing between A to B reminds me of the Eggman. There was a man here. There was not a man here. The eggs are not too important, not too unimportant. In the card, the man asks, Every day is a day of love if only you believe it so. Do you believe it so? He gives no response to whether you answer yes or no. This is exactly what happens in chapter 2. Well, there is a man here. He might be happy to see you. What do you think? Following your input, you get the egg regardless of your thoughts. What I find interesting is that both of these pieces of dialogue also put very much emphasis on reality being what you think of it, I guess. Like, asking you, every day is a day of love, but only if you believe it to be that to be the case. And it's asking you if you believe it. Same thing with whether or not the man is happy to see you. I mean, there's a sense with the Eggman in general that he's an oddity who's not defined by yes or no. He's here or he's not here, and, you know, that's how I feel with this. As far as disappearing goes, when you drop the egg, the game asks, what egg? The Valentine's note disappears, just like the man does after reading it. There was a note here. There was not a note here. This character is clearly fond of us and is quite happy in this letter. This matches with the man in the car who is happy to see us. So this is it. The constant suggestions of A or B, starting the sentences with the word well, asking you a question and basing reality off your answer, only for it to mean nothing anyway. You could even argue that, seeing as Gaster never really disappears in Deltarune, the letter disappearing and having nothing once your interaction with the man was done is more a reference to the way that the man and the eggs all have the air of whether there is or isn't an egg or man or ever was an egg or man depends on your interactions and thoughts about it. Existence based on sight and thought alone. Frankly, this helps explain why the Valentine's person says it's ironic that he's forgotten the name of the person he is supposed to help. Gaster is not forgotten. I know this will be a contentious point here, but it's true. After his untimely demise, it's specifically stated that Asgore took a long time replacing him, specifically due to his brilliance and the difficulty of getting a replacement. Furthermore, the core and remnants of Gaster still exist. But this man? Well, the second he's out of your life, the second you get rid of the egg, it never existed in the first place. His name in the URL is unknown. He's forgotten. What egg? There wasn't a man here. Remember how in the Spamton sweepstakes, Noelle got a weird egg labeled special? Do, do you remember that? Okay, everyone, rather than accepting the obvious, jumped to the conclusion that this was Spamton's white egg and that Noelle is Spamton's mom. Yay! But that's not the case. No, because Spamton himself confirms that the blue peepus was entirely different and the white egg was not his. In Noelle's blog post about the white egg, she gets the egg. It's given a message in, alongside it that says special. She cannot get rid of it, and when she clicked on it, all it did was make a weird sound. If you use the egg in Deltarune, all it does is make a weird sound. If you throw it away, it re-enters your inventory when you enter another dark world. The egg eventually left Noelle. It left home due to happiness. Happiness, the only emotion that the Eggman is shown to have, and the only word that really does describe the emotions present in this Valentine's card, and is even in the Valentine's card itself. The most important part? Noelle doesn't remember the name. This, of the egg, I mean, of the egg. This isn't a side detail that's brushed off. She can't remember it despite just desperately trying and the fact that this is focused on. I mean, it's focused on. They literally say, one more thing, I can't remember the name of the damn egg. It's been driving her crazy ever since. She cannot remember it. This character has been forgotten. Spamton specifically explains that Noelle's white egg is another man's treasure. The man. The only man who's been called out to us. The Egg Man. What this means is that the Egg Man has a purpose beyond handing us random eggs. Who is he? What is his goal? Well, very easily you could say that he, too, is a Gaster Fragment. He's another piece of Gaster, or whatever. Really, it doesn't matter to me what his actual name is. It could be Gaster, it could be something else, it could be Johnny, I don't know. What this tells us is that Gaster, in all his voidy power, is not alone. And the Gaster from the intro hasn't been relegated to a silly side character 
just yet. So in summary, this letter doesn't expand on Gaster. It goes against everything we knew about him. Every mark of Gaster's dialogue is absent from this character, but instead he sounds just like the Eggman. The repeated use of the word well to start a sentence, the binary existence or non-existence based on perception, the disappearing after interacting with the letter, the being forgotten. And while the Eggman sure could be some variant of Gaster, it's important to note that Gaster, the intro Gaster and the Valentine's writer, are two separate characters. Thank you for watching. I am positive Gaster's gonna be the final boss. It's gonna be awesome. He's gonna say, I am evil and Satan and Ben drowned and now I'm gonna kill you. And it's this cool fight where Phantasm Penumbra plays and it is the coolest fight in all of gaming. Oh, the ghost in the machine is back and every version of Chris and Des is awesome. It's here and it's so cool. And I am sure, and if I'm wrong, I am going to make the most scathing review of the game.